In January 2022, the nonprofit organization Public Health and Medical Professions for Transparency, made up of public health professionals, medical professionals, scientists, and journalists, won the case against the U.S. FDA involves the Freedom of Information Act request seeking all data and information for the Pfizer vaccine. The court ordered FDA to release the related documents at a rate of 55,000 pages every 30 days. Was the FDA trying to hide the Pfizer vaccine data from the public? Was information listed in one of the most discussed post-authorization adverse event reports concerning? Let's find out what we have learned from this report and how the monitored adverse events compared to the reported COVID-19 complications. I'm Dr. Han, and welcome to my classroom. When was the Pfizer documents released? The document that is highly discussed recently, in fact, has been available since November 17, 2021. The Texas federal court ruling was in early 2022, so we have to realize the FDA did not release this particular document because of the court order, but instead from the initial Freedom of Information request by the Public Health and Medical Professional for Transparency. But FDA could have done better to release the data for public scrutiny. Instead, FDA argued they lack the labor power to process the documents fast enough for public review. Now, their response to the request is an example of problems within the bureaucracy. It is the FDA's obligation to efficiently inform the public when so many people are being asked or mandated to take the vaccine. So, what is in this post-authorization adverse event report? This particular document provided an overall analysis of all the post-authorization safety data collected in the U.S., U.K., and several countries in Europe and 56 other countries from December 1, 2020, to the end of February 2021. And here is the breakdown of the number reported. The majority of those were reported from the U.S. and U.K. We must realize that these numbers are in association with the Pfizer vaccine, and there was no evidence documented in this particular document to verify these reported numbers are directly related to the vaccine. In Table One, they listed 42,086 case reports with 1,223 fatalities. The total events were 158,893. These events were collected from various Pfizer database and similar adverse event system in other countries. However, this report did not tell the public how many doses of the Pfizer vaccine were shipped during this period. They also admitted that these reports are submitted voluntarily, and there was no way to know how much under-reporting had happened during that time. So this document did not provide the critical information for us to calculate the percentage association with the vaccine. But we also need to realize, even if the number of the total doses were given, they were only associations and not causation. Some of the more common adverse events are broken down in this table. Now, this is a direct adaptation from the Pfizer document. Most notably, the most reported adverse events are general disorders and administration site conditions, followed by nervous system disorders. Muscle skeletal disorders, GI or gastrointestinal disorders, skin respiratory disorders, and some infections. Now you may ask, could we approximate or estimate the percentage of association of events between December 2020 to February 2021? Now, in fact, we could, but we need to first understand the grade. Limitation before attempting such approximation. First, I need to emphasize that the number of adverse event reports and fatalities was only an association. And second, the number of doses given that is available 
in the public domain does not tell us precisely how many people had received the vaccine because that was a two-dose series. And if a person received the first dose in February 2021, they would not have received the second dose in the reporting period. And now let's look at the publicly available data. Now, based on the available data on our world in data, on February twenty eighth, twenty twenty one, twenty nine point three five million doses of the Pfizer vaccine were given in the EU. Now, this data did not break out the UK, so I assume UK was included in this EU data, even though I know UK is now not in the EU officially. And thirty eight point four three million doses were given in the US. Now, relatively few doses were given in other countries during that time. So, approximately sixty-eight million doses were given, and when all the estimation are put together, there may be a zero point zero zero one eight percent fatality rate per dose, and a zero point zero six two percent of adverse case report rate per dose. Again, I need to strongly emphasize that these numbers are only crude approximations or estimations based on publicly accessible data, and it is to get a relative perspective only. It does not prove anything. And please do not quote this number. I say it again. Please do not quote. This is only for a perspective. Now the next questions. What were the adverse events of special interest? If you check out the document yourself, and you will see at the end of the document there was a list of adverse events of special interest consisting of many many diseases. This list was created based on expert groups and regulatory authorities' data. The list of medical events were associated with severe COVID-19 and events of interest for vaccines in general. The long list does not indicate everything that was happening with the vaccine, but instead they are events that need to look for or pay attention to. Table seven gave us a summary review of the cumulative cases within the adverse events of special interest categories in the Pfizer safety database. Now, take cardiovascular events as an example. This report identified 1,403 cases of cardiovascular events. 946 cases were serious. The most common event was tachycardia, or a heart rate of over 100 beat per minute. 136 of the 1,003 cardiovascular case reports were fatal. Now, Pfizer concluded that these numbers did not raise new safety issues. We need to pay attention that half of these events happened in less than 24 hours after the vaccine dose. Unfortunately, the public does not know the baseline cardiovascular fatality rate and how they related to the age of these reported cases. We only know the range of the age, but unfortunately, we don't have individual report in this particular document. So the Pfizer conclusion, this statement, really needed a lot more backing data to be convincing. The table listed myocarditis and pericarditis in the immune-mediated or autoimmune adverse event of special interest, but again, they concluded these cases did not raise new safety issues at that time. But now we have a consensus that myocarditis and pericarditis is directly related to mRNA vaccines, particularly. In young males, so this tells us that there is a lot more granular data needed for us to review before drawing a definitive conclusion. After reviewing this document, I have given a deeper thought about the reported autoimmune or immune-mediated adverse events of special interest. So I would like to do a little bit comparison between these special interest adverse events. And compare that to the reported COVID-19 complications. 
There have been reported cases of new onset autoimmune phenomena after the COVID-19 vaccine, now such as autoimmune liver diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, and a few more. At the same time, there are also reported new onset of autoimmune conditions following COVID-19 diagnosis. Now, when we take a step back to basic cellular biology and immunology, the way mRNA vaccine work is to induce the MHC cas1 to present part of the spike protein for the T cells of the adaptive immune system to recognize. And in comparison, virus infected cells also present. The part of the viral proteins in a very similar fashion, and there is a certain degree of similarity between the two at the molecular level. Now, still, we have also seen there are differences clinically because not all the people who received the mRNA vaccine have symptoms that partly resemble an acute COVID-19 infection. The question remains why there is such a wide range of differences in immune response toward the mRNA vaccine and toward the COVID-19 disease itself. We have here many severe disease and also mild disease before the availability of the vaccine, and we have also here severe reactions to the vaccine, and some people didn't react anything to the vaccine. So why is that? Now, while there have been many years of research in vaccines and mRNA technologies, we have only learned about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the disease for about two years. Now that we are moving into a relatively lesser urgent stage of the pandemic, maybe it's time for the scientific community to re-examine if the virus is the best fit for mRNA vaccine development. And could there be a safer and a more long-lasting vaccine available for COVID? To sum up, the Pfizer document was a little outdated, and the public will have to wait for the FDA to release more data in the coming months in order to fully understand the extent and implications of these reported adverse event. Now, this channel is about health topics that are beyond just the pandemic news. And if you think I've earned it, please hit the like and subscribe button. And I would like to see you again in my next video. And like always, please stay safe and stay healthy. And thank you for all of your support. And please take care. Bye.